So thank you all for finding your way to our first Friday event here in July. As you may or may not know, these events are sponsored by the Town of Woodside's Arts and Culture Committee, a group of volunteers who try to provide interesting programming once a month here. Um, this evening, we are very lucky to have our current presenter. And next month, we're going to have natural history continuing the theme with a look at Edgewood Park, one of our local parks. So if you haven't been up there, we're going to have a docent there who will be telling us some of the history. Very fascinating. Before the program begins this evening, I'd like you to please silence your phones. Peter will be uh, answering questions after. He also has brought his book and a marine mammal guide of the North Pacific. The books are $44, and Peter will be happy to personalize them with his signature. And the marine mammal guides are $10 each. Um, Peter and I go way, way back, <laughs> longer than perhaps uh, either one of us want to remember. Uh, but Peter is a, a fantastic uh, illustrator of marine mammals. He's been involved in a lot of films, including Star Trek, The Voyage Home, Those Humpback Whales, where um, Peter, he also did Free Willy, The Orca. He's been involved in a variety of cinemagraphic uh, activities using his skills and knowledge of cetaceans and marine mammals. So this evening, we are very lucky to have Peter talking about entanglements, which is something, unfortunately, that happens a little more frequently than any of us would like to think about. So without further ado, Peter Falkens. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, how to start out. Um, it's interesting that Tom and I actually go back to around 1975, which was almost 50 years ago. And this was very soon after the Marine Mammal Protection Act came into to, uh, fruition. We have a mutual friend who thinks of entanglements as being whale bondage. And I thought about that term and realized that the first whale that I relieved from bondage was 62 years ago next month. Now, it was a fossil whale that was in bondage thanks to 13 and a half million years of silt. Uh, but still at the ripe old age of nine years old, I was digging up whale fossils. And over time, I've, I've actually found six unique species of whales. Um, <clears throat> well, when it comes to dealing, that's where my, my fascination with whales began. Uh, was that long ago. <laughs> An interesting side story real quickly. I was so fascinated by these parts of the whale that I found in the dirt in the Central Valley that I wanted to figure out what they looked like when they were alive. And I was fairly adept at math, and so I would finish my math papers in the fourth grade fairly quickly. And I would spend the extra time, rather than sitting there and fidgeting, I would draw pictures of what I thought whales looked like until my uh, fourth grade teacher called in my parents and said, you've got to get him to stop drawing. And so I didn't do any more drawing until high school. And I'll make an interesting link there. One of my classmates from high school, East Bakersfield High School, is here. Dave, say hi to everybody. <laughs> and uh, uh, we shared physics classes, I think math, and maybe a few other classes together. And so it's, it's kind of neat making you know, that big leap now. Here we are in Northern California, and we went to high school together. And back then, I was uh, getting back into art. Dave can tell stories about some of the art that I did and all the trouble I got into with some of the double entendres and the, the 
cartoons and stuff, making fun of teachers and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. My first marine mammal that I uh, disentangled was in 1979 uh, on the island of Cedros in uh, Baja, Mexico. And the first whale that I was involved in disentangling was in 1996. And so what I'm going to speak to today is an overview of the entanglement issue, how we got to where we are now, what we're going to be doing in the future, and go over in detail one particular response that had some very interesting aspects to it that I, I hope you'll appreciate. And so, this meeting's being recorded, okay? Some of you, I know Tom does, know uh, Dr. Roger Payne. He died uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was a uh, colleague and friend of mine. We're on a first name basis. We did work in Alaska, and uh, uh, we did a lot of work on uh, humpback whales. He was the one who made popular the humpback whale song. You've, you've heard of that. You might recognize his name as well. And so he was a very big mover and shaker in uh, appreciating uh, whales, in particular right whales in South America, the East Coast, and also uh, humpback whale songs that came out of uh, Hawaii. And then also Joe Howlett, which I'll elaborate on that a little bit later on because he plays a part in this whole presentation. And so this gives you an idea of what a whale encounters in an entanglement. All of those little pock marks and the lines and the scars and stuff like that came from an entanglement that was slapping the whale as it was swimming and surfacing. And you'll see scarring as it was working down the body uh, you can see the scars on the dorsal uh, peduncle surface. And this animal didn't lose his entanglement. It ended up cinching around the tail. And so for literally hundreds of miles, this animal was dragging around a pot. Now back in the 70s, when entanglements became a particular concern, a fellow named John Lean up in uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia area, um, got to thinking about dealing with this problem. He was dealing with humpbacks and fish traps. And his approach to releasing the whale was to tie in to the emotional state of the whale in order to affect a positive disentanglement. And he told stories about where the manner in which he approached the whale, it's kind of like a horse whisperer, that he was able to have his associates actually stand in the mouth of an entangled humpback whale and the whale would stick its tongue up to help the individual to cut the lines from, uh, from around the head. And so I, I knew John uh, back in the 70s and uh, kind of bought into the notion of the suffering that these animals endure what we can do to diminish the suffering and then also affect a disentanglement so the animals could participate in the, uh, in the population. Now, if we go back, uh, the data that you see right here goes back to 1989 is when there was direct observation and quantification of the population of whales. Prior to that, there were a lot of estimates based on whaling records um, back in 1966, it was estimated that the whales off the California and Oregon coast were really no more than about 100. 100 animals out of an original population of about 15,000. And so, as, as you can see, as colleagues in the, in the business were counting whales, doing mark and recapture, uh, tail photo IDs, and so on and so forth, you can see how the population started to rise over the last few years. This takes it up to, uh, uh, I think it's, it's updated uh, 2022. But at the same time, there's a lot of Dungeness crab. There was variations in the amount of crab landings, but they started to go up quite a bit. Now, there's some very interesting things that come out of that graph. When we add to it, 
to confirmed entanglements by year, going back to 1981, roughly uh, the same time that we got the uh, 82s. You'll notice that when there's rise in crab landings, there's also a big rise in entanglements. And then you look at the rise in population. Three things were happening all at the same time. There's information in these charts that are not really obvious. One is the discovery of something called the prey compression index. This is a rel relatively new notion. Uh, what it does, it looks at where the prey items are that the whales prefer and whether they are compressed close to the shore or if they're more offshore. And what we found in the prey compression index is that when you have a warm water event like an El Nino, the krill production is not very strong. Matter of fact, it's almost non-existent. You have a big seabird die off and the preferred prey of the whales are schooling fish that are closer to shore. Well, on this year, right about here, they had another problem, and that was the quality of the crab was not very good. They had demoic acid poisoning in the crab. And so they delayed the opening of the fishery. Well, the problem with that is when they finally got around to opening the fishery, you had fishermen from Oregon, all up and down California. It became a compressed derby, and they were just throwing their pots in the water with no regard for how deep it was going. And so they left a lot of loose line in the water that then entangled more whales than we had ever seen entangled before. And so this prey compression index influenced what would happen, but there was also a fisheries management problem and uh, uh, a population that was growing at a rate of about 7.5% a year. So you had a very strong good news. The whales were coming back from roughly 100 animals to, as you can see there, what are we, about 6,000 in the California population in that period of time. That's the good news. The bad news is, well, we had popularity of crab coming in there. So there's different types of entanglements based on the materials. We have long line uh, monofilament. We have the Dungeness crab that uh, usually when it, uh, when it gets into a whale, it's either, either around the mouth, they're picked up on the pectoral fins, wrapped around the body, and then it migrates down to the tail. And, uh, and then gill nets. Gill nets are... Uh, are a big problem in places where there are gill nets. In the previous um, uh, slide where it showed confirmed entanglements, there, you could see a bump uh, in the uh, early 80s. That's because after the Vietnam War, uh, fishermen who were refugees from the uh, war were allowed to fish with their gill nets, which then created a huge impact on whales and harbor porpoise in particular until the National Marine Sanctuaries got kicked in in the early 90s, and then um, they outlawed the gill nets. But we still get gill nets that are brought up from, uh, uh, from Mexico. Now, there are other materials that are kind of interesting. One is anchor chain. We have a whale that actually got hung up with anchor chain across its mouth and wrapped around its lower jaw. Not a fun situation, and... Our normal tools for cutting an anchor free doesn't work very well. Imagine a pocket knife out there trying to cut through anchor chain. And then non-crab uh, ground gear. It could be spot prawns, uh, it could be uh, ghost crabs, it could be uh, uh, cod, black cod, uh, marker buoys, a number of things create a problem with entanglements. And we also get these really weird things, aquaculture frames, brought up from Mexico, where they've got aquaculture going on near the lagoons where these animals breed. Uh, the animals are looking for snacks with some mice and amphipods and things like that near these aquaculture establishments, and they end up with a metal frame around their head. And there's different types of entanglements, wrapping around the head. wrapping around the body.
a body wrap that then migrates down to the flukes, creating a very interesting pattern that uh, is seen in a number of different species and a number of different uh, degrees of severity of entanglement. We get a peduncle wrap, which is around the body, and we get a wrap uh, that goes around a pectoral fin, which is uh, a little bit difficult because if you've got a lot of weight pulling on the pectoral fin, you can cause an amputation. And you can get with a compound where it goes around the face, around the pectoral fin, and the flukes, and the animal is kind of hogtied. You can't swim very well. And one of the more difficult ones to deal with are mouth entanglements. Um, the one on the right is, uh, there's another picture of this animal later on, which is kind of interesting. But the animal is grounded to the bottom by uh, 600 feet of line that goes down to spot prong traps. And the animal is feeding on its side. You know, go on their side, they open up their mouth, they're uh, pursuit gulp feeders, and if there's a line in the water, they get it. This entanglement was observed from the beginning by a whale watch operator that noticed a lot of uh, flaccid line in the water and said, that's going to create an entanglement. Five minutes later, we got this entanglement. The other one is a gray whale had picked up a, uh, a crab trap and had been dragging it down the Oregon coast. And you can see how it was cutting through the lip all the way down to the mandible. And you have extreme injuries. You notice up here, there's no whale attached. That entanglement caused a complete amputation of the flukes. Here's one that, uh, that I worked on where uh, the flipper is, is an axilla wrap. Um, there are right whales that have a lot of problems with axilla wraps and are, are killed because it cuts off blood supply and, and they die that way. This animal uh, didn't die, just lost his right pectoral fin. And then also, if a trap gets on and is on for a long time, the animal can't feed and they end up being so severely emaciated they will not survive. And so one of our goals in the network is to be able to respond to these animals quickly enough to be able to reduce the suffering of slow starvation that happens with this kind of situation. When we're affecting a disentanglement, we oftentimes have to encounter the whale's behavior Animal, imagine the animal gets hung up in a, in a trap and they're trying to shake it, they're trying to get rid of it. And so we'll start doing things like breaching. So this animal has got wrap around his body and he's trying to break the line. Very dangerous to try to walk up to the animal and say, can you hold stills while I cut the line? This, remember the, the animal that had the... Uh, the line in it and it went down to the bottom that I mentioned a few minutes ago with all the loose line. This is what happened uh, literally about two hours later when we're trying to figure out how to cut the animal free. If you see way up there that little metal thing, that's our cutting grapple. This animal started to act out when we were up close to it and so we had to back off and we did a field modification where I ran a line between two boats with the cutting grapple in the middle and we drifted into the whale, and as soon as we felt the line, we pulled on one end of it and cut the entanglement, and the animal reacted by doing this, by throwing the gear up in the air. You can see in here, over there is our telemetry buoy. We use a satellite connection to be able to track the animal so we can try to... Uh, uh, get to it. I have actually lost three satellite buoys because once we got the buoy on, the animal decides to run offshore and then down to Mexico and oftentimes ends up in the uh, garbage patch in the western Pacific. Each one of those costs about $12,000. So uh, we don't want to do that too often. And then this is one where we've been working on the animal for a while. The animal is still entangled but it goes about feeding. So even though the animal has been 
constrained by an entanglement. We're there, you know, the old words, we're from the government, we're here to help. So we're trying to cut this animal loose. Here we are in our little rubber boat, we're trying to figure out where the animal is, and he comes up and he's feeding, doing lateral feeding while he's entangled. And so we find situations where while we're trying to disentangle the guy, they're busy being a whale, which is actually a good sign. It's telling us the whale's trying to be a whale and he's not targeting us, trying to give us a hard time. Sometimes when we are uh, out there working on the animals, we are a perceived threat. And so the animal will actually lash out at us. And that is the flukes of a whale, and that's my butt. (laughs) Later on in this disentanglement, the whale slapped at us again, and we all went down in the boat and kind of hunkered down because we didn't know if the animal was going to flip us or if it could hit us. Imagine... This animal is a gray whale about 20 feet long, a ton of foot, 40,000 pounds of animal going after what's essentially 800 to 1,000 pounds of human beings in a boat trying to help it. The the contrast, both in terms of power and mass, is kind of impressive. Now, a key aspect to evaluating entanglements is getting recites and being able to recognize what an entanglement was that the animal broke free. Now, you might recall back in in the uh, earlier slide, I mentioned on there that there were 270 confirmed entanglements during that period of time that the graph covered, roughly the last 22 years. Well, these mark recapture studies of the whales where we can see evidence of an entanglement tells us that we miss about uh, 9 in 10 of the entanglements. In other words, what we get reported is 1 out of 10. So that means over that period of time, there were not 270 entanglements, there were probably 2,700 entanglements. That's how big a deal it is. And you see different levels of scarring. The one on the left, it looks like a body wrap, but there were no lines in the animal. That's just a scar from a body wrap where the animal probably powered through a grounding, split the line, and the line eventually came out. On this one over here, we see the flukes. Remember that little diamond pattern I showed you on on, uh, that one video? Well, this is one where the animal was not freed, and the entanglement simply cut through the blades of the fluke. And so the uh, animal went through life uh, without a fluke. In the process of understanding the whole process and and what's going on, we try to look at the time involved and the level of injury and whether or not the animal is going to be survivable. This animal was seen uh, fairly soon after entanglement. Probably a week later, you can see where the line was already starting to embed. Uh, 30 days later, we we put a, a, a telemetry buoy on it, the animal ran offshore, went down to Santa Barbara. We're watching our computers every night, and we see where the animal's going, and so we launched a response in Santa Barbara. We got to it, and uh, God, I should have added the video to this where I've got the knife going right into that little loop and cutting it right at that loop, and we got the animal completely free. Well, 30 days later, he shows up within 120 feet of where he was first entangled. And line is all gone, still has some uh, abrasion marks, no lines, but he's acting like a humpback whale. So this is one of the examples where we have shown that by responding to these animals in time, they will survive and they become a contributing member to an endangered animal population. So this is the value of what we do. The... uh, IWC, the International Whaling Commission, uh, 25 years ago put the value of a whale at a million dollars a piece, the commercial value, and uh, some people have taken that to show that the uh, natural history, the whale watching business, what they contribute to the environment is worth at least a million dollars. So our meager little response to cut this animal loose essentially had an impact of a million dollars on the environment. 
Inflation might have that up a little higher than now. Now I'm going to talk about one entanglement response. Go back to July 5th, 2017. Joe Howlett was killed by a, humpback, by a uh, right whale while he was trying to disentangle it. Uh, the circumstances were that he had uh, removed almost all of the line and decided to go back and get the last little bit of it. Well, at that time, the whale was feeling more free and was trying to get rid of the last of the line, and the flukes came up and popped Joe and killed him. He was the third responder to die doing this. The Natural Marine Fishery Service that controls the permit that Joe and myself and other people operate under shut down the disentangling operations throughout the United States, including Hawaii, West Coast, East Coast. Just said, okay, everybody stop. We've got to figure out what happened because we can't let this happen ever again. Well, a week later, we get a report from Northern California outside of Crescent City that they find this. And it's close enough to shore that recreational boaters, fishermen, can all see it. And so there's a big meeting amongst the, uh, the NOAA fisheries officials that are part of this and say, we got to do something about this. It's already in the media. If we say we're not going to do anything about this, it's, gonna, it's not going to look good for the program. And so they're trying to decide, okay, who's, who in the world's going to take care of this? So I get a phone call from the uh, National uh, Stranding Coordinator, and he says, we've got an uh, tangled whale. We've got nobody to respond to it. In talking amongst all the other responders, you're the only one who has experience with this type of an entanglement. Is there anything you can do? We'll understand fully if you don't want to do it, considering that Joe Howlett had died just a week earlier. And, and they said, you don't have to free it. We'll understand if you can't do that. We'll understand if you don't want to respond at all. But we at least got to go out and, and get some analysis to figure out what's going on, how it happened, see what fisheries is involved, and so on and so forth. And I said, okay, I'll do it on one condition, and that is that I get to choose my team. In other words, I can identify specifically who I wanted on this. One was uh, Jean de Marniac from the National Marine Sanctuaries. The other was uh, Ryan Berger from uh, Point, excuse me, Point Blue, uh, uh, which is, used to be known as PRBO, works in the Farallon Islands. And, and I said, okay, if that can be my crew, we'll go up and, and we'll do uh, something about it. So we had a, a uh, phone conference with all the primaries and uh, talked about what was going on. Coast Guard got involved, Oregon State got involved, uh, and what we were told by the primary permit holder, Terry Rowles, is nobody gets hurt. You cannot let anybody get hurt. You know, we don't care if you just go out there and take a few pictures, nobody gets hurt. Well, you can guess what happened. So, the next day, uh, or a couple days later, we send up a Coast Guard helicopter to take pictures to try to get a sense of exactly how bad this entanglement is. And we can already see from uh, a couple of days that this animal has been entangled, we're starting to see a lot of uh, chafing and scarring and, and damage to the whale around its head. The animal is having a heck of a time breathing because it is being held down by a uh, group of pots. We had no idea how many pots. Uh, we suspected that it was a, uh, a coon stripe pot string. And uh, we find out later that what happened was there was an illegal um, cod marker buoy that the state had required that the cod fishermen had to work within a particular area, but they didn't provide a way of determining what their limits were. So they put down a buoy with a big anchor at the bottom with a float on the top marking where the limit of their fishing area was. This whale got into that, through its mouth, 
wrapped around and then dragged it across what we found out later to be 12 sets of uh, a clean stripe prong. Each set had 10 buoys on it, or not 10 traps on it. Okay, this will be a fun time. So um, we drive up uh, all night. Uh, Ryan Berger is up there, and John is where is John? John Demarniak is over here. And so the first step is to involve the fishermen that reported it, and this was crucial to what we were doing. All the guys up against the wall were the fishermen. They started out. I'm not really sure they want to fool around with these environmentalists, these crazy environmentalists. By the end of the meeting, they were loosening up. We told them, we're, we can't save them all, but we're going to do what we can for this animal. Coasties are over there. They gave us a, a cutter. And then uh, in the middle are people from uh, Oregon State University, Humboldt State, and a rescue group called uh, the North Coast Marine Mammal Center that deals primarily with pinnipeds. And so I set the tone of expectations. Everybody had their job. We got our butts in gear bright and early the next morning. And uh, we had two primary response boats plus the Coast Guard cutter. And so we hooked everything up, added air, uh, got all the gear together, got the team together, and then went out looking for the critter. Uh, went a few miles offshore, he found the animal. When they're coming up at an angle like that, they're telling you they're having a very difficult time breathing. This animal had been in this state for more than a week now, having difficulty breathing. But we're seeing buoys in lots of different places. Mind you, at this time, we didn't know what we were dealing with. So we launch a drone out of the, um, the cutter. The drone operator was from uh, Oregon State University, a very competent guy. One problem was is that these uh, Coast Guard ships have really sophisticated radio communication stuff, which starts to get in the way of the drone stuff. And so we were losing contact with the drone until we figured out what was going on and toned down the uh, electronics on the, on the cutter to where we could get a, a, a view of kind of what we were dealing with at the whale. So we had a tag line up there that had a buoy off the far end. There was a bullet buoy off the mouth. There was a wrap around the head, which indicated it was probably a mouth entanglement. We had additional buoys that were around the right pectoral fin, plus additional buoys that were wrapped around the flukes. A compound entanglement, one of the most complicated ones that we'd ever seen before. When we got out there, we started to do our underwater look with our GoPros. And we, it's, it's, we're supposed to interpret what's going on with this kind of an image. But we can figure out which lines are going under the body. Uh, we, the white of the pectoral fins off to the side, so that confirmed that there are buoys tightly cinched up uh, next to the pectoral fins. And then we've got a line that goes up to the gape of the mouth. Well, by that time, the fishermen are advising us that they think that there is a string of pots and they know where the end of the string is, where one of these multiple strings is. And so we said, you know what might be useful is if you get onto that end, knowing that the whale's at this end, why don't you start picking up the pots at that end? One of the main things I try to do is remove the gear from the environment. Not just save the animal, but remove the gear. I don't like the idea of cutting the animal free and saying, hey, hey, hey we saved the animal and then you're leaving all this crap in the water. So I try to pick up the gear as, uh, as best we can. So remember this image and the amount of spooling that you see and the one line that's coming down. That image changes. So the drone's up, drone's taking another look. We have it set up where we can see the poly balls and the bullet buoys and the stuff that's around the whale. We have the um, tag line to the system you notice my engine is up because if I'm running the engine and I'm running up to the animal, it's going to be bothering the animal. I mean, you imagine, you know, I'm sneaking up on you and I'm going, to go, no, it doesn't work too well. So I wanted to go up as quietly as I could. 
And so we walked up that line so we could get close to it, so we wouldn't, wouldn't make the animal be afraid of us. And then we had the support boat, and the uh, National Marine Fisheries guy said that in case anything is going wrong, we want the support boat to be able to pull you off of the whale immediately. So they put in a tagline to pull us off as we were getting closer to the whale. So we get up there and we're trying to let the whale know. You see Jean over here, he's got his hand on the yellow line. He's walking us up on the whale while we've got our poles out. And what we're doing is, we've noticed that the whales sometimes are scared by the light reflection off the knives. And so one of the things that we learned from this is that we now paint our knives so they're not reflecting light. Because we got as we put the knives up, the whale could see it and the whale would react. It would go down and come back up and then go down again. And so as we snuck up and got within one pole length of the animal, the, the total length of the pole is 35 feet. And so we're roughly 30 feet from the whale. And so what we do is we touch the back of the whale, saying, that doesn't hurt, does it? Kind of like what you do with a horse. You know, you want to get, get the animal sensitized and realize that this big, long, weird thing in the air that you've never seen before isn't there to hurt you. So we notice the line going across the top, that this is around the mouth. This is probably where it hurts the most. We want to work from the head back to the tail. So we want to start here. Fascinating thing about this animal, it, it did those aggressive kind of uh, head butts. And then as we touched it and we made additional approaches, the whale then settled down. And at one point where we moved up to the whale, darn it all, if that whale didn't turn towards us to present the line. And what we saw was a gap right uh, behind the blowhole, kind of where the, the uh, scapula and stuff come up and then you've got the, the central vertebrae. There's a little dip in there, which became our target place to put our first knife. And so we hooked onto it. You can see by this picture, the animal's tilted towards us a little bit. And so we got the knife under there, and then one cut, we got both lines. So from there, you can see the line that went over the top of the head is now sticking up. So we're now controlling the animal with this poly ball we're seeing all of these other buoys that are going down to the pectoral fin, and we're trying to figure out how do we simplify this entanglement. Meanwhile, the animal's doing head outs and giving us really strong blows and stuff. And remember what the feds told me? They said, you know, nobody gets hurt. Here we are with the whale underneath our boat, and we're, we've got big sharp objects and we're pointing at the whale. And so we're going about our business, hoping that the whale understands. And so Ryan here is uh, got a pole with a camera down there. We're trying to figure out, is there anything at the fluke or at the pectoral fins where we can uh, start to reduce the wrap around the pectoral fins? But we're also noticing over on that side, the length of that rope that used to go over the top of the head was less. Also, the attitude of the whale was now flatter at the surface. The part from the other side of that cut that went down to the flukes was sitting over here. Remember, that line used to be over there. So that connection was starting to do what we call flossing through the mouth. So the line was loosening, and the animal was able to rest at the surface a little bit more. And not being a stupid animal, the animal goes, my situation is improving. It's better than it has been for the last... 10 days. Maybe I'll see how this goes. So we're trying to figure out how to deal with this stuff. Haul back line. The whale actually comes down and underneath our boat. Again, going back to what the Fed said, nobody gets hurt. We've got this animal's powerhouse right under our boat. 
from the first sighting, this was taken off a guy's cell phone, and so we had to enlarge it, but we're noticing the damage that has been done to the whale. And you can see where we cut it. That cut used to be over on the other side of the blowhole. So there's probably a good two and a half, three feet that has already flossed through the mouth. But we're seeing damage that's done to the animal's uh, maxilla. Now this is something that I had seen before in uh, a whale specimen that was at the uh, National Museum associated with the Smithsonian. So you can see, as th this is the um, uh, upper palate of the whale. You can see this line was cutting into the palate. Imagine that the roof of your mouth, you know, had, had been abraded that way. And then up on the mag maxilla, the second arrow shows where it was abrading the bone that was there. So it had already cut through the, uh, the skin and was abrading the bone. And then you can see a big notch over by the maxilla. If I, if I back up a little bit, you can see over here how it has cut into the maxilla. That's exactly what happened to this animal on the same side of the head. So it's something that we've seen before in, uh, in whales, and we know the damage that it can do. But over the course of this disentanglement, now we've got this where there's only a couple of inches of frayed line when it used to go all the way over the top of the head. We're making progress. Yay. This is the edge of my boat. This is the whale coming up underneath my boat. Well, we got a really good look at the uh, line there, but the haulback is on the wrong side of the whale. So that doesn't help us out at all. So I make a decision in the field that all right, no more haulback line, that's too dangerous. I'd rather be thrown into the water and wearing a uh, life jacket than being pulled against an angry whale that hits me because I can't get away from it. So we decided to, uh, uh, to stop the pullback idea and see how this animal uh, ta uh, deals with this. Now imagine the blowhole. The blowhole's about this big. Right? The whale, this is the edge of the boat. And I'm standing there that close to it. So our, our, our three responders are all in this boat right next to it as the whale comes up and blows whale snot on us. And, you know, we got to clean your glasses and stuff. So this is one of those oh shit moments where you're going, all right, I was told nobody gets hurt and we got this whale doing this. Well, it uh, didn't get any worse from there. The animal, again, uh, there's, this is the middle of my boat. This is where it says whale rescue on it. If any of you know photography, you know how a wide angle makes it look farther away. Uh, kind of like in the Jurassic film, you know, objects are closer than they may appear. Well, that's what we have going on here because it's a wide angle lens. I can just barely get the animal's head inside this wide angle image. We got our knife right there. We're supposed to be trying to get the stuff off his pectoral fins when he comes up underneath the boat. So we're having to deal with that. The animal settles down. We picked up Dennis. Dennis is a veterinarian with North Coast. And so there we are with our, uh, our buoys. We put a grapple down because what we're trying to do is grapple the downline and pull it up to the surface so the animal can relax completely at the surface. And so that's what we're trying to figure out here. I'm holding on to one of the lines that goes down to the flukes. John's holding on to another. Uh, Ryan's got one of the big floats that we want to put onto the grapple to try to get this, this thing pulled up to the surface. And Dennis is back there with what's left of the haulback line. Meanwhile, the fishermen have, are winching up the traps. Remember in the earlier image I showed you the one line? Uh, you're going to have difficulty counting all of those lines. Now, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven traps, plus the traps that have already been brought up, plus all of these additional lines that are going down to more traps. This is what the animal had to deal with. So as they're working at it, they get to the point where our grapple comes up. 
I mean, what was I thinking? That I could put my little grapple on that and pull all that crap up by just three guys in a, in a small boat. So they're winching this up. You can see all the traps being stacked in the back. These are still lines that are all going out to all these additional traps that aren't up yet. So we're still trying to get the pectoral fin undone because we have no idea that there's so many other traps that are still hanging off the flukes. But this gives you an idea how close we are. Again, that's a 30-foot pole, and we're right there. The animal's doing its head outs. Well, the situation starts to change a little bit. You notice you don't see any of the, well, you see a little bitty tiny bit of the frayed line. The line has almost come completely out of the mouth. The animal is now more horizontal at the surface. Some of these buoys that were attached to the flukes are now up at the surface. That means the animal is now laying flat at the surface we can hear the difference in the animal's blows. Uh, an animal that is stressed can give a trumpet hum, hum, kind of a sound. When they start to relax, it's and the distance between the blows starts to change. If it's rapid, or with a little trumpet associated with it, the animal's pissed off. This animal's starting to relax. We're going, mm, okay, there might be hope. And so now we're at the point, see what's different over there? You're seeing the dorsal fin. The previous shots, we didn't see the dorsal fin. The dorsal fin is two thirds of the body back. The animal's now at the surface. Now we know, because my grapple is showing up there, that there's approximately 65 feet, because my grapple line is 65 feet. We know that there's an arc of line between what they're spooling up there. You can see all the traps in the back. And, and the animal, is now at the surface. We're still winching him in. So we're bringing him closer. So now we've got a line that goes straight down. Now we're thinking, we've got the knife all ready to go. We're coming in. I'm driving. Uh, I, uh, I'm a level four. The level four is responsibility for the rest of the crew. So I want to be driving so that if I need to back out, I can do that. And so I, I put my right-hand guy, Ryan, on the bow, and uh, then Dennis is taking photographs. And so we're going in there thinking that all we have to do is cut that line, and it'll be free. Fat chance. We start getting closer. The animal starts to feel what's being pulled on it. It's getting closer, and it's now not acting out at us but it thinks that it can shake the line. My boat was very close to that line, and I didn't want to get between the whale fluke doing that and a hard metal object on the ocean, remembering nobody gets hurt. Also remembering the times that I got slapped by a whale fluke and remembering Joe Howlett. So we see that going on. So we back off, we move to the other side of the whale. The whale is now up close to the fishing boat. We told them, stop winching. We let the animal relax. Very easy blow. Not a, not a stress. He's straight back. His flukes are at the surface. He can breathe easy now. He does something kind of interesting. I don't know if you can tell the body shape. He's turning around and he's looking at the boat. What is going on? Why am I in this situation? See that, that big curve there? It's called a predator inspection. He's, he's, he's looking back to say, okay, there's something going wrong with my flukes and I want to see what's going on. So he turns around and he can actually take a look at his flukes. We get the knife up on the boat. We've got the last of the lines that we can deal with. The whale could very easily be thrashing. Completely calm. These were the last cuts. This is, you can see all the chafing 
that was caused by the multiple wraps. We've already got a bunch of leftover stuff in the wild. There's only three more lines across there. So we can cut those fairly easily. And so at this location, the animal was cut and was finally free. You can see how all the lines went, uh, went loose. The whale's flukes are here. The animal's free. Well, what do you think happened next? Well, truth be known, I was doing this with a slip disc the whole time. <laughs> and I had to call the support boat to bring over as much Excedrin as I could. But the animal's free. So what do you think happened? Well, the animal swims over to our support boat, which is very handy because one of the things we want to do is get photo ID of the animal to try to track it to see its survivability. Well, the fisherman. come back three times and say, thank you. <laughs> That's the fisherman talking, not me. Watch the fisherman. Oh, my gosh, you saved a whale. The whale, in fact, came back to this boat with all the cacophony of the generators going, the winch, and all of that, and it actually circled the boat three times. Well, in that process, we were able to get the left lateral and the right lateral dorsal fin so we can try to identify this animal uh, at another time. The drone was getting dorsal shots to see if we could get enough sharpness of the trailing edge of the flukes to try to get an ID that way. The only underside photos we got were taken on a cell phone about uh, 150 yards away. And so we got those pictures, we enlarged them. The problem is that the algorithms that sharpened the images took too much detail away from the trailing edge and we could not use our identification algorithms to identify this whale to see if it was in the, uh, in the catalog. So all we really had to go on was the, uh, uh, the dorsal fins. So we put the drone up and there's the whale on his third pass going around the boat. Now you'll notice that they're winching up the remaining line of the, uh, of the sets. And the whale is right there underneath all that noise. Our support boat's coming over to retrieve our buoys and stuff while this animal is uh, still just checking it out. Here he comes up, you see that, how he's turned towards Easy blow, that was not a forced blow. He's right there, you got the lines coming across. The whale doesn't care. I'm over here saying, where the hell did the whale go? <laughs> you have some miscellaneous pieces that we had cut free over there that we had to go, go grab. The support boat's coming up, the whale is just sitting on the transom. Support boat's coming up, the whale swims towards the support boat makes a right turn as they're throwing buoys overboard. The uh, support boat is not aware that the whale's there. But if you watch very carefully, there goes one of our buoys being thrown over. You'll see the whale come up right there on the left core, or the port quarter of the, of the fishing boat. See him? He's coming up. There he goes, right there. Not concerned at all. <clears throat> So we're picking up all of our garbage that we'd, we'd left in there. And so this whale then comes around the front and like a good western, swims off into the sunset. <laughs> or rides off into the sunset. So. so this ended up being the most complex single disentanglement effort. There he is off the bow of the boat that had ever been uh, attempted on the west coast. Not only was the animal freed, and you'll notice as he's swimming off into the sunset, literally, you'll see the, the fluke beats becoming more rapid. That indicates really normal swimming behavior, meaning this animal probably survived, despite what was going on with the mouth and stuff. This animal probably survived, and we retrieved all of the fishing gear 
and nobody got hurt. And so, what, what have we been trying to do since then? This year, there's been an unusual increase in entanglement, not necessarily from California uh, Dungeness gear, but from gear that has been brought up from Mexico and brought down from Oregon. We've had uh, a big spike in entanglements this year, and uh, we're trying to figure out why, because the prey compression index has most of the prey off on the shelf right now. The, the krill density is near historic high uh, uh, densities. The oceans are relatively cool, getting off the end of a uh, La Nina. And uh, there's the Coast Guard boat. Got credit the Coast Guard wherever we can. And, um, and so most of the population is now sitting offshore. It's in the hundreds. You might have... Uh, uh, remember the comment earlier about there was a time when there was only a hundred humpback whales in the entire California and Oregon coast. Now they're in the hundreds out by the Farallon Islands on the edge of the uh, of where the, the slope is, where all the uh, upwelling occurs. And so, what am I doing now? Well, let me back up a little bit. One thing we're trying to do is look at the survivors and try to get a uh, a sense of exactly how successful we are uh, with, these, with these disentanglements. And so here's one, an animal that, that was nicknamed Rope. It's in the catalog. CRC is Cascadia Research Collective. And it was first uh, documented as an entangled adult in, in 2009. And since then, it's been seen 22 times. Uh, most recently on my birthday in uh, uh, 2019. And the whale returns to the same area every year. And so we're now collecting a catalog of these animals that were known previously entangled who have survived to kind of say, yeah, maybe what we're doing is a good thing. Now, one of the things I want to do, I'm doing, involves that creature. It's a black Labrador retriever named Luke, spelled L-E-U-K. You get bonus points if you can figure out the play on words. What I'm training Luke to do is smell the stress cortisols that are emitted by an entangled whale. We have a big problem that when we hear that there is an entanglement, we need to get the team out there to find it. The reporting party can't always stand by. So we have to go out hour, two, sometimes days later to try to find the entangled whale to deal with it. Well, if an entanglement is holding the animal down and you've got any sort of a bump in the ocean, finding the animal is going to be very difficult. But we know that the whales give off stress cortisols when they're entangled. I mean, like if, if something happened to you, if you got injured, you're going to start blowing off stress cortisols. And so the dog can pick that up. And so we're, we're training him to pick up on the stress cortisols as well as the smell of uh, decomposing flesh. Because so we have to have the combination of the decomp and the stress because when, an, when a humpback whale is nominally behaving like a humpback whale, it's a social animal and sometimes they will be uh, uh, battling each other and when they get pissed off at other whales, they will be blowing off stress cortisols as well. So when we're dealing with dozens of humpbacks in the same area, we got to pick the one that's entangled. And so we have to combine the uh, decomp with the stress cortisols. And so um, I'm working with Luke to, uh, to try to figure that out. And so that's kind of a, a new project for me. And um, so that's what I do. Thank I'll you, stay Peter. here as long as people right. ask questions. <laughs> well, at the beginning, Peter mentioned uh, a friend of ours, uh, Roger Payne, who recently passed away. And I wanted to read a, a quote uh, from Roger that I think is very apropos for this evening's discussion. Uh, Roger said, I have received criticism for spending time and treasure trying to translate what I refer to as whale speak. My accusers complain that the needs of humans 
should always come before the needs of non-humans. But the reason humanity finds itself in its present predicament is in major part because we have always put the needs of humans before the needs, the rest of life. So, uh, just something to think about from uh, Roger Payne, who's no longer uh, with us. Uh, he was a, a friend to Peter and myself. So, uh, again, hope you enjoyed this evening. Thank you for coming. And uh, pick up a book for Marie Mammoth.